All right. Um, well, uh, once again, my name is George. I'm, I'm so happy to be here. Um, I just want to say my wife, Stephanie, is here, and then my brother-in-law, Jeremy, is here, and then we have a little uh, three-year-old, or almost three-year-old boy named Landon, who's in the uh, nursery right now, probably playing with trains uh, still. And I, uh, tonight, I'm just excited to be able to share my story and just share a little bit about what I've been through and some challenges that I've faced, and uh, hopefully, um, I just hope God speaks to you in, in, a, in a way that um, you know, you can hear, and I hope that you are inspired, and I hope that you are impacted. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I was born in Romania, uh, and I was born without arms. And I, I don't tell people that all, all the time, by the way. Um, consider yourself lucky that I just told you first that I was born without arms. Sometimes I'll just make up a story for some people. Um, last year at the beach, I told this five-year-old little girl, you know, kids have no filter at all. Um, when they see somebody different, so this you know, little girl is like, whoa, what's wrong with you? And I just said, I, when I was you know, a little kid, I didn't eat my vegetables um, when my parents told me to. And she kind of freaked out for a second, but now I'm thinking about it, I'm like, my son is actually almost five, and he doesn't listen at all. So I'm starting to think, like, maybe I could use just the whole no arms thing to get him to start listening, because we're trying to figure out like, how to get him to listen. I'm like, okay, if you don't go to take a nap, you're going to lose your arms. <laughs> Anything that works. Um, yeah, so I, I was born in Romania, and I was born without arms, and, um, you know, because I was born without arms, my biological parents, so I, I, I have a mom and dad uh, somewhere else out there, um, in Romania, not somewhere else out there, I know where they are, uh, they're in Romania, um, but when I was born, they couldn't take care of me, uh, because it was a big deal that I was born like this, I was, I'm imperfect, um, which is kind of what the whole philosophy over there was that when a baby was born uh, different, they were, they were believed to be less, uh, believed to be kind of less human. So, you know, everyone around my parents kind of hated them and hated me, uh, but hated them because they brought somebody like me uh, back uh, to their village where they lived, and I was this curse on their village and all this stuff. So my parents decided uh, that they would put me in an orphanage um, where hopefully, you know, I could have a better life somewhere else out there. And, you know, the beginning of my life was not a very happy tale at all because it was the same thing in this orphanage where uh, they hated me. They, they thought I was a curse. So all the nurses who worked there, um, they did not take care of me. They did not, you know, give me any, you know, nourishment or love or care or anything. Um, when I was two and a half, I weighed nine pounds. And I was, uh, I came very close uh, to, to dying in this orphanage. And, you know, just telling that beginning of the story, you know, it, it, it seems like a really hopeless situation and a really just, like, that's where the story would end and that, oh, this, this child without arms and he has no hope. Um, and I don't know how many of us ever feel like we have no hope, um, but really the, the, where, what my message comes down to and why I'm here is I want to share with you uh, hope. Uh, because this is the first of many times I would experience God working in my life um, when it did not seem like God could work in my life. Um, you know, I, I was adopted when I was, when I was two and a half um, by my uh, family now. Uh, everyone in the orphanage, all the nurses, all said that I was just a waste of a life, that I was not fully human, and even the doctor uh, who came in and looked at all the children and all, all of us babies, he saw me and he just said, there's no hope for him, he's just going to die soon anyways. But, you know, God orchestrates everything. Um, according to his will and according to his perfect plan, um, which is sometimes uh, a thing that I tend to lose sight of, and I think it's the thing that we tend to lose sight of, is that God's plan is uh, perfect uh, for our lives. Uh, my parents adopted me and, and brought me home, and I, I want to talk a little bit more about my family, but if I talked fully about my family, it would take a really long time. So uh, my parents adopted me. Uh, they had three children of their own, uh, they, had a, they had a son and two daughters. I mean, they still have. Um, and uh, those are their biological children. And then they adopted me. And then my parents uh, went on to adopt uh, 12 more kids uh, from five other different countries with a couple of special needs and just a couple of crazy stories and things you would not believe, but, but God just brought this whole family together. My parents always, uh, they, my dad likes to joke around a lot. He always calls... Um, the biological, uh, like, you know, our older brothers and sisters, they're the homemade cookies and we're the store-bought. <laughs> um, and if we're actually talking about my family and my mom, store-bought is better than homemade. Um, I'm just going to say that right now. Um, I, I want to tell you a really quick story, though, about my brother. So I have a brother uh, named James. 
And James is from India, and he was also born without arms as well. Uh, he was the next one adopted after me. My mom uh, became just, she became addicted to adopting. Adoption became her ministry, their ministry, and she became just addicted to it. And she um, saw that there was a boy in India uh, without arms who, who was in an orphanage who needed a home. And my mom just kind of put the, I mean, it was, wasn't very hard to do, but she was like, wow, George could have a brother who's just like him so he wouldn't feel alone in the world, you know? And uh, on paper, that sounds great. Uh, but, you know, James came uh, home for the first time. And I remember this really clearly, too. And I was probably like four at this point, and he was two. Um, but James came home, and he, um, he went over to one of my toys, and he just started playing with it, like with his feet. And for some reason, because I'm possessive, I didn't like that at all. And I went over to James, and I, I uh, took my leg, and I tripped him. And he fell and hit his head on the tile floor. It made just like a loud cracking noise. Okay, that sounds like violent. Just a loud thud. Um, not like a cracking noise, that's bad. But like a thud. And then I was like, okay, yeah, you know, don't, don't play with my toys. And then all of a sudden, he trips me. And I fall and do the exact same thing because they're both armless. So we both pretty much fall the same way. I mean, there's really not much to it. You just fall, you can't catch yourself. Um, uh, and then we just started flailing our legs at each other. And that began a rivalry that would last for eternity. Um, not eternity, but me and James growing up, you know, we, we, we could not be more different other than the fact that we don't have arms. We are so very different. So we would fight a lot. It was one of those things where if James really made me really mad, I would, at first I would say, okay, well, James, I was adopted before you and I worked. So you're kind of here because of me, because I was a good kid and mom and dad decided to get another one like you. Uh, I know, I'm evil. Um, and, and, you know, I'd say that, and then we'd start fighting. But before we fight, okay, like, okay, uh, okay, let's sit down. So we, like let, it, like, let each other sit down. And then it's just, like, legs just flailing. And um, the hardest part of your foot is your heel, right? We would hit each other with our heels. And my dad would always say, like, James, stop healing George. George, stop healing James. And we would, I mean, we'd stop because we'd be like, that, that doesn't, you can't, that doesn't work. You can't say that. So my family is crazy, but I love them. Um, adoption is my parents' ministry. I'm so happy to be a part of uh, uh, my, my family. Um, you know, growing up, though, um, without arms, it was one of those things where um, I had to learn how to do pretty much everything that everybody else does, but I just had to figure, out, figure it out in my own way. Um, so a lot of the times, um, kids will ask me when I'm at a school or something, and I'll do like a question and answer time, and they'll be like, so how do you brush your teeth? And like, how do you change your clothes? And like, how in the world could you, could you, one kid asked me how I walked upstairs. Um, and he was a high schooler. And I, I, I'm pretty sure he was being serious. Like, I mean, I, sometimes you can tell when the like, kids are just being sarcastic. This kid seemed really concerned. He's like, how do you, how do you like walk up the stairs and, you know, not fall? And I guess, I think I know what he meant. He meant like, how do I hold on to like the railing and stuff? Um, but I just tell people, like, I just do it with my feet. Like, I brush my teeth with my feet. I drove here in a normal car uh, with my feet. Um, just from day one, you know, I tell people, not having arms is all I've ever known. So I just learned to do everything uh, naturally. And as a kid, that just all seemed really normal to me and to, you know, everyone around me. And we lived in a really small uh, town up in Connecticut, and we went to a really small church and the only friends I had were my siblings and like two friends from church, and that was pretty much like all the kids in the church. So I lived a really small, safe, comfortable life. But when I turned 12, and I, I was going into sixth grade at this point, uh, we, as a family, moved from Connecticut to, uh, to here, to, to Richmond. And we lived uh, over in Mechanicsville at the time. Um, and, you know, I was going to go to Oak Knoll. I was going to go to middle school. Uh, like a public middle school for the first time. And, you know, my parents told me this, like up in Connecticut, they're like, okay, so we're going to move, we're going to move to uh, Richmond, Virginia, and you're going you're to go to a bigger school so that you're going to make more friends. And I try, for the most part, to be optimistic in life. You know, I just, I think that we should all strive to be optimistic in, in everything. Um, and even as a kid, for the most part, I try to be optimistic. So I was thinking like, okay, I mean, I'm nervous. This is going to be really different. But, I mean, what do I have to do for, like, middle school students? Just, like, open a water bottle with my feet. I'm like, ta-da, ma magician. Let's be friends now. Um, I, I had really low standards. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I learned really quickly, pretty much from the, the first day of, of middle school, you know, being in public middle school as a sixth-grade kid uh, without arms, 
I'm very different than everybody else. And, uh, you know, for the first time in my life, I experienced, you know, kids looking at me weird, kids laughing, kids whispering things about me, kids, you know, mocking me and using their feet. I remember walking onto that bus for the first time, and, like, this is, like, a big yellow bus. I was like, what is this thing? I, like, walk on it, and I'm, like, kind of dirty. Um, but I was like, okay, I guess i got to sit down with no seatbelt. Um, and just all eyes on me because I was the weird one. I was, I was different, you know? And it's, it's normal for us as humans to, to just notice what's different. I, I think that's just a very normal thing. But from that point on, for the next couple years in middle school, going into high school, I would just be bullied nonstop throughout school. Every day at school, I would just be picked on. I'd be called weird names. I, I would not make any friends for the first, like, four years of living here in Virginia. I did not have one friend. I... I went through this, and, you know, going through this kind of stuff as a middle school student, you know, I, I, I don't know if you've ever um, experienced bullying, if you've ever been bullied or anything, but, but you start to question a lot of things. I mean, it's easy to question things about God, and it's easy to question things about, you know, being created and faith uh, when bad things are happening to us or when we see bad things happening in the world. Even it's easy to question, you know, just like the validity of God and his lovingness. And I, I started to wonder, and I started to ask questions like, you know, if God is so loving, because I, I, I mentioned earlier, I grew up in church, so I grew up hearing all of the stuff that we hear a lot, you know. Uh, but I started questioning at this point, you know, if God is so loving, then why, why did he just, like, decide that me, the one out of a million, and then James, another one out of a million, would be born without arms, you know? I didn't quite understand how such a loving God uh, could do that. And um, I don't know if you ever asked, have ever asked those uh, similar questions of, you know, if God, is, if God is so loving, then blank, fill in the blank. I, I don't know if you've ever been there, if you've ever done that. Um, but, you know, that, I think that's a normal, a pretty normal question to ask. I think it's what you do next that really matters, that really determines the direction your life is going to go. And my direction of my life did not go in a very good way. Uh, after this, because I started asking those questions, but I wasn't really asking, like, honestly to God. I wasn't saying, like, so, Lord, you know, what was your purpose in creating me with arms? No, I was saying, like, God, how could you do this? How could you do this to me? I, I, I don't want anything to do with you. Um, one thing I always just like to throw out there and say to wh- whoever I have the opportunity and the privilege and honor to talk to is I just like to say, you know, God has a purpose and a plan for your life, but the enemy also has a plan and a purpose for your life too. And he is very real. And I I do think that the enemy knows, he very well knows that God has a plan for you. And he knows that, that God can and wants to do just great, amazing things and, and fill your life more than you could ever even imagine. He knows that. And I, I just believe that He's going to try to do everything he can to take you away from that bridge that can, that can bring you to, the, to that purpose. I think the enemy will try to separate you from God and try to make you believe things that just are not true. For me, I was beginning to believe these lies that kids are telling me, that I'm just a freak, that I'm never going to amount to be anything, that I'm never going to be important, that I'm just going to be a loser all my life, that I shouldn't be here, that, that I'm, I'm just a freak of nature. I started believing all of these lies that these uh, kids were telling me at school. And, um, you know, when I started believing that, I started seeing myself in the mirror and I started hating, you know, what I saw back. And my heart became really, really dark and really hateful and really angry and really depressed. And I had certain thoughts of, you know, it might just be easier for me to just end it all now because I don't think I can go to school tomorrow and be bullied again. I don't think I can do this. I don't think I can keep on doing this. I, I was really just, at this point, eighth grade, ninth grade, I think I was in ninth grade at this point because I was a freshman and it was just happening all over again, you know? Um, at this point, I was just at the end of uh, my rope. And I, I don't know where, where you guys are in your life. I, I don't know... Uh, what you're going through, if your life is great, if your life sucks, I don't know where you are, but, you know, I know what that feeling is like of being just done, 
with everything. I know what that feeling of just being at the end of a rope feels like. It's not a good feeling. And, you know, you, we just wonder, you know, where are you, God? Where is God? I mean, I, like I mentioned too, you, you don't even have to look at your own life. All you got to do is just look around. And it's so easy to just wonder, where is God in all of everything that's happening in the world right now? And sometimes we, we like to think, you know, God is causing this. Like, God, how could you do this? When something bad happens to us, we like to think, God, how could you do this to me? But when something good, when, when life is going great, then God, you know, I, I'm, I'm good. My life is great right now. I'll call, I'll call you when I need you. Right now, things are good. So, I mean, you do what you want to do. I'll, my, I can do this on my own. But then things go bad, and we, we, we say, God, how could you do this to me? You know, I, I've struggled a lot with, with that question of God causing bad things to happen. And, you know, I, I did this thing for a while, too, as a student, and, and you, you might be able to relate to this in, in a certain way, but this is a bit extreme. But I would, would be up late at night as a middle schooler, so it was like 10, but I thought I was up like super late. Um, but I'd be in my bed, and I'd just be like, crying and, you know, just slamming my head in the pillow and screaming my pillow. And I'd just be like, God, if you are real and if you do love me and if you do, if all this stuff is true and you did all these miracles in the Bible and all this stuff, then, then technically you could just make me wake up tomorrow with arms, right? Like, I mean, couldn't God do that? And why wouldn't he do that? Doesn't the Bible say we can just pray and ask for what we want and then God will give us what our heart, the desires of our heart? And believe me, I had no bigger desire than to just fit in and to be like everybody else, to be like all of you. I had no bigger desire than that. And I just prayed and just said, God, if you are real, then prove it to me and make me wake up tomorrow with arms. And that does sound extreme now that I look back and I think about it, but I think to an extent I've done that over and over again. And I think we've kind of all done that in a certain way where we kind of just say, Lord, Lord, if you could just help me with this, if you could just take this away, if you could take this pain away, if you could just help me get through this test, if you could help me pay this bill, if you could help me with this relationship, God, then I'll be set, then I'll, just my, that, then I'll be content with my life. God, if you could just do this for me, then I'll be content. And I, I mean, I do believe that, you know, sometimes in, in, in God's will and in God's plan and his timing, he does give us what, what we want, you know, he, sometimes he does give us the desires of our heart, but too often we try to bargain and try to kind of make God into this thing that just gives us whatever we want and we try to create God into who we want him to be instead of who he is. And, and that is uh, the God who has a, his purpose and his plan for our life. And I, I look back at that time where I just said, God, if you could make me wake up tomorrow with arms, and I, I just realized how, how stupid that was. Me just trying to bargain and me just trying to say, God, if you are real, then prove it to me on my terms as if I know better than the God of the universe, how best to show himself to me. Because I look back, I'm like, you know, if I did wake up tomorrow with arms, and maybe I did, and then I just forgot to eat my vegetables again. Um, I don't know. No, I didn't. I never woke up with arms. But if that happened, I mean, that, obviously that would have been one of the coolest miracles ever. It would. I mean, we hear about miracles all the time. So I was like, I mean, why, can't, why not me? But then I realized there would have come a time probably not too long after, where something else in my life would have, would have come up. And I would say, well, God, the whole arms thing, that's really cool, but you know, I'm used to that now. I'm, I've had arms for a couple years, but now I'm going through this. God, if you could just help me with this, then I'll be content. My dad has always told me growing up, and, and he says this too whenever he has a chance to talk to people. He's always like, we'll, we'll never be fully content with just things. We'll never be fully content with just our own just wants and our own desires. Well, that will never truly fill us. That's why we always need something else. That's why we always need a new thing. That's why we always need a new experience, something fresh and something new, because we think that something will fill us, but it just, it does for a second, but it's not going to fill us the way that we were designed and created to be filled. And that's with the Holy Spirit. That's, that's with Jesus. That's what's his, with his purpose for our life. And I don't know if you have your Bibles with you. I, um, there's a verse, just real quick, there's a verse in the, in the Bible that completely uh, shifted my whole entire perspective on, on God and everything. You know, I, I think in church we like to, you know, just say like, oh, it changed my heart. Um, but I, I like to think that God just does more than change our hearts. He changes everything about us. 
He changes our minds. He changes our thinking. He changes our perspective on life. Um, anyways, so there, there's, a, there's a passage in the Bible, and I, I'm not going to read it because I don't, actually don't have my Bible, but I, I have it memorized, I think. Um, but if I get it wrong, then one of you guys can call me out and blaspheme. Um, but it's the, the, the verse is John uh, chapter 9, verse 3. And this is, a, this is the part in the Bible uh, that just, just completely turned me around big time. Uh, so basically, Jesus and his disciples are walking down this road, and the disciples see a blind man on the side of the road. So they see this disabled guy on the side of the road, and they, I, I think it's so funny, or I love it, because it's so human of them. But they, they kind of immediately throw him again to the side. They're like, oh man, poor guy. They're like, Lord, why is this man afflicted so? What, what, what went wrong? What happened so that this man would be, have to be blind, have to go through life blind? What, what happened? What went wrong? They're like, what? I'm adding a lot of whole different stuff, if you can't tell, if you're in your Bible. <laughs> um, but they said, like, you know, did he sin? Like, did he do something wrong? Or maybe his parents sin, sinned? And when I read that, I mean, I was in church, you know, I've heard this before, but this time I read that part and I was like, wow, maybe that, you know, see, there it is. Maybe my biological parents are really bad people. You know, maybe they sinned and that's why I'm being punished without arms. You know, I kind of, that thought went through my head. When you're depressed, a lot of thoughts go through your head. Anyways, um, and then Jesus just kind of corrects them. And your Bibles won't say this, but I do kind of picture Jesus at this point, like shaking his head a little bit, kind of in like, in like, I don't know, disappointment, because he's probably like, you guys have been hanging out with me for a while now, I think. I mean, John chapter 9, I don't know how long it's been between verse chapter 1 and 9. But anyways, he's probably like, you guys still don't really get it. But he corrects them, and he just says, you know, it wasn't by anybody's sin that this man is blind or anything, but no, this man is blind uh, so that the works of God could be seen uh, through him. And when I heard that at this time in my life, at this point in my life, thinking about just ending my own life, I heard this and I kind of just had an awakening moment. I just kind of thought, if Jesus says that God will work through this blind man, then, I mean, maybe there's a chance that Jesus could work through me too. Maybe there's a chance that God wants to work through me too. Maybe there's a chance that God wants to work through you too. And this is my favorite part. I, I'm not the only handicapped one in here. You know, I, I, I really, me not having arms is just, that's not my biggest handicap. That's not my biggest disability. That's not the most broken part about me. Every, the most broken parts about me are all on the inside. The most broken parts about us are all in the inside. And what this verse tells me is that we are all broken. We all are messed up. But the fact that God wants to and still can use us despite our handicaps, despite our disabilities, despite our brokenness, I think is just incredible and amazing. And I think that that should open our eyes to the fact that, okay, I'm going to try my best. I'm going to just lay it all down to him and just say, okay, here's everything I'm dealing with. Here's all my fears. Here's my anxiety. Here's my stress. Here's my depression. Here are my suicidal thoughts. God, just take it and just... Just use me. I think when that, when that becomes our prayer of just God, use me, everything else in our life will change. Everything else in our life will, will turn around. Because no longer are we controlled by all that weight and all that stuff, all that stuff of the enemy, all that sin, but we are guided and directed by, by Jesus. And I mean, like I said, I don't know where you are and I don't know what you're going through, but I just want to encourage you. And I hope that you being here tonight, and I, real quick, I do believe that everybody in here is here for a reason, not just here on this planet, but here, like tonight, at Arise, for a reason. I think there's something, maybe not even something I say, but maybe something in the worship or anything that God is trying to speak to you. So now's the time to just ask God, you know, what, what are you trying to tell me? What do you want? Why am I even here tonight? Maybe you came here because you were invited. Maybe you came here because you had nothing else to do on a Friday night. Would you like me? No, I'm just kidding. No, actually, it's true. This is where I'd rather be than anywhere else. But I want to encourage you to, 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 to let that be a prayer of God. God, use me. Take, take all of this, take everything, all the good, all the bad, and, and use me. Um, real quick before we, we just 
uh, move on. I'll, but we're going to play a song real quick too in a second. But you know, one thing that somebody did say to me after I went through this time in my life, and that you know, God completely changed me. And I shared my testimony for the first time at my uh, church in high school. And this lady from our church kind of came up to me, and you know, she said something like, "I don't know. This, this is. I've talked to Ethan and Ashby about this too. I was like, I don't know about this whole theology stuff. But anyway, she goes." She goes, you know, I'm so sorry about, you know, all the bullying that you went through and all those mean kids, but that was all God's plan for your life, you know? And this kind of, I just, real quick, this kind of goes back to, you know, the debate of whether God makes bad things happen to us for his plan. But I kind of think otherwise sometimes. I kind of think that, you know, maybe bad things happen to us, and, you know, maybe you think this too, but maybe bad things happen to us just simply because we live in a broken world. I mean, we were born into sin. This world is sinful. So because of that, we're going to experience sin. I, I, don't, I really don't want you to think that, that God makes bad things happen to you because that makes God into this evil, just wrathful God who just punishes us and, and, and who creates bad things for us for his, for his plan. But you know, the Bible talks about too how you know, God creates beauty from, from brokenness. So I, Sometimes I don't like to think that it's God doing these bad things because I don't think that God is the author of pain. I don't think God is the author of pain and suicide and depression and rape. I don't think God is the author of that stuff. He's not the author of abuse. He doesn't cause those things to happen. I, I just, for some reason, cannot bring myself to believe that. I just think that those things happen because we live in this broken world. But that's not to say that God can't make something beautiful out of those things. And that's where the hope comes from, where these bad things happen to us, where we're going through something just impossible that seems hopeless, but we just can put our faith and our trust that, you know, God, I believe that you can do something even with this. Even with this terrible situation, God, I believe that, that you can do something through this, that you can, you can bring me out to the other side and show me that it was worth it and show me that I'm a better person now because of what I went through. No, God, that wasn't you. That wasn't you doing that. So I'm going to stop this whole, how could you do this to me? But no, God, what I'm going through now is just because I'm a sinful person. And it's even more so when, when like, we go through something bad because of our own choices. But when we, when we make bad choices and then we go through something bad, we still sometimes say, God, how could you do this to me? God's like, what? It's like that meme where the guy's like, what? Sorry, I love memes. <laughs> that's our own doing. That's, that's our own sin. But, yeah, like I said, other times we are just affected by the sin that's around us. So uh, before I close, before you know, the rest of the team and I um, play one song for you, um, I just want to encourage you to take everything I've said and take everything that you know, you've heard, and uh, I hope you see how God has just worked in my life and continuously been faithful, even when things seemed hopeless. And I hope that gives you hope that whatever you might be going through tonight is not a hopeless situation. It's not over. You know, your life isn't over. God's still working. God can still work through you. God still wants to work uh, through you. So I, um, I wrote a song um, a while ago uh, called Not Abandoned. And uh, this song is about adoption. And uh, I wrote this song because I was just thinking a lot about my life and you know, God's kind of words to us as, as, we, as we, if you're a believer in here, if, if you have put your faith in Jesus and that he is, he is your savior, then you are adopted as well. And, you know, I like to look at my own life as an orphan and then as an adopted child and how that just completely is a great image and a perfect example of God's adoption for us before we were orphans and then God adopts us and we are his children. Um, so I, I wrote this song uh, called Not Abandoned. Um, and it's, I think it's, it's kind of God's words to us. Well, I don't want to say that because it's not the Bible, but it's, you know, God's words to, I don't really know. Um, I don't know why. When, when I, I love speaking, but whenever I like talk about my own songs, I don't even know what to say. I just, you got to hear it, I think. And um, again, too, I just want to thank you all for being here. And again, to Ethan and Ashby and, and the rest of the team, I... I it is really such an honor to, to be able to uh, just speak here and, and share my heart and share my story. And I do pray and I do hope with all my heart that something I said uh, stuck with you, you know? Every day, every hour.
tower wondering if you'll make it out you've been here for as long as you can remember trapped inside this hollow shell you're not abandoned you're not alone there is a family who wants to make you their own you're gonna find out and on this broken road there is a pathway that's gonna lead you home to me. 